Hello everyone and welcome to Hypersode 1 for Artificers. Uh, I am Dib and I'm joined by Pandemonia and uh, Seer. And we are going to be talking about Artifact. But before we start talking about the game itself, uh, let's get to know... Uh, um, well, let's get to know my co-hosts. Uh, starting with you, Pandemonia. Tell us a little bit about yourself. So, I, I start, it all goes back, as a kid, I played a lot of competitive chess. and I played for like 12 years provincially. And then eventually I went to Magic the Gathering, which is the card game. Uh, one of the original card games. I played that quite competitively. And then after that, I currently play competitive Hearthstone. Mm -hmm. And now, sort of, so I have quite a, a strategic and, you know, card game. And I'm quite well known in the South African Hearthstone scene. Uh, I've won some tournaments and uh, I've won some of the lo big local events. So, yeah. Yeah. So definitely that kind of card game background there. And um, yep. Sia, you have a, a bit of a different background. Yeah, yeah. Hey, guys, I'm Sia. So I'm more of a Dota player. I've, I've been playing for over 10 years. Uh, I was fairly involved in high-level South African Dota, but never at the top. Um, sort of, you know, in like B, B, B tier teams. Uh, but yeah, I have played Dota for a long time and I am knowledgeable about the game. So... I'm looking to come at this from, yeah, more of a Valve and Dota angle rather than a card game. Cool. And I mean, you obviously do also play some Hearthstone and I think you've even played some... Yeah, I like the game. Casually, I wouldn't say I'm so. good. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I do like card games. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and for me, uh, I'm Deb. I, I've i also been playing Magic for, I don't know, 10, 15 years now, a long time. Uh, I've played a lot of Hearthstone. I... Uh, Panamonia and I co-host uh, Magma Rages, which is a Hearthstone podcast. Uh, I've also played a lot of uh, Dota, not like at it, kind of the level Sears played, much more casually and low tier, but like you know, f like 4,000 or 5,000 so hours of Dota. So I've played I played enough of it. Uh, it was kind of my first love when it comes to esports. Uh, it was the first game that I was really interested in getting involved in competitively, but ultimately uh, much more involved with uh, Hearthstone these days as a caster and um, player and podcast host etc etc uh, so yeah we're going to be talking about artifact so uh, that's what you're all obviously here to hear about and uh, that's enough about us so artifact is valve's um, tcg that was announced last year at the international uh, basically we got very little information almost none other than the fact that we were going to see a tcg last year uh, but now in the last couple of weeks a lot more information has come out about artifact uh, so we're going to be talking about that and uh, just breaking down everything that we have so far. Uh, the t uh, this is a TCG based on Dota 2. Um, uh, so all of the, the heroes and the lore are kind of based around that. Um, yeah, so I mean, first of all, let's kind of discuss, uh, like, how do you win? Well, what is the uh, the way, what is the, the main mechanic? How do you uh, achieve victory in Artifact? Uh, Sia, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, okay, so... Uh... In what we've been reading about Artifact so far, uh, it is going to be based on... Uh, it's going to be a card game representation of how a Dota 2 game works. So in Dota, there are five heroes on each team, and you push and kill the enemy's ancient, and that's how you win in Dota. So in Artifact, it is going to be a similar theme where, um, as in Dota, you have a full game, but within the game, there's three different lanes, middle, top, and bottom, and each of those lanes contains heroes, and you can win in each of those lanes. So in Artifact, there's going to be three separate boards representing top, middle, and bottom, and on each board, there's going to be a tower, so a tower belonging to each team, and each tower is going to have 40 HP. So if your team, uh, the cards you control do 40 damage to that tower, it is destroyed, and that exposes uh, the enemy ancient. Much like in Dota, when you destroy towers, then you can access the enemy ancient and win the game. So uh, once the ancient is exposed in Artifact, it has a HP pool of 80. So if you can deal 80 damage to the ancient in Artifact, then of course you win the game as well. But then additionally, there's another win condition in Artifact, such that if in two separate lanes you're able to destroy the tower, the game's also won. So you can win through dominating a single lane and doing 120 damage effectively, or by winning two lanes and doing 80 damage only. Yeah, so those are the two sort of win conditions we know about. 
uh, to start with at least. That seems to be, you know, the, the main mechanic um, of the game. Uh, but, uh, you know, we can kind of see the, the three boards here. Uh, y you can see each of the different lanes with different uh, cards and then we'll talk about the, the cards and, and the player's hand, uh, uh, which seems to be, you know, across the different lanes. Um, how do the... How do you actually deal damage with to, to towers and that uh, in in artifact? Yeah, so we don't have a lot of information just yet. I, do you have that picture of the? Yeah, yeah. I'll, uh, of I'll the bring board. Up the okay, cool. The board and stuff. So um, we'll go into details about the cards themselves now. But basically, on each board, you you it seems that you play cards, and the cards uh, attack into each other automatically. So the best comparison we have so far is how Hearthstone chess works in that. You place your cards on your side of the board, and then at the end of your turn, they automatically tack into the enemy cards on the other side of the board. And if there's no enemy card available, um, either it'll attack into adjacent enemy cards based on another mechanic called roads. I think if you look carefully, you can see arrows above each of these um, attacking cards, yeah. and they are pointing the direction that, that their damage is going. So the only one that's deviating from the straight attack is the dire lichen yeah uh which seems to be attacking zeus yeah but that mechanic isn't clear it seems that only comes to, into effect when there's no corresponding enemy card on the other side of the board and then of course if there's no enemies then presumably you'd attack into the tower yeah uh so yeah that's that's how attacking seems to be working yeah so placement seems to have a very uh, important role on how the board how the cards are actually situated on the board uh, that kind of nicely leads us into actually talking about the different uh, card types. So uh, one of the main types that we've uh, seen is the, the hero cards. We were talking about, about them here, there. Um, one of the examples we have here is Axe. Uh, so Axe is obviously a well-known uh, Dota 2 hero. Um, and for Axe here, we have an attack value, a health value, uh, an armor value, which seems to be this one in the middle, as well as uh, some different item slots um, um, there are going to be 44 different heroes in the, um, in the uh, st like uh, on launch for the game, uh, and 280 different cards in total. So we can see that there's a lot of other cards besides the heroes. So it's not just all about heroes. Uh, there's a lot of the support cards we can see um, in these examples with the single board. You can kind of see the the spells uh, in the hand. Um, there's also some other minions. You can see some of the creeps, you know, the, the Dire and Radiant creeps here, as well as some mm -hmm. other kind of minions that it's difficult to see say what they really are. The, the one wolf that we see in this board. So there's also going to be a lot of those. And then uh, going back to uh, the Axe card, we can see there's also items. So Axe has some items in his item slots here, uh, a Claymore and a Ring of Health, which are augmenting his hero card. And that's why you see the numbers here for his attack and health in uh, green. That's kind of deviating from uh, the starting state of his um, uh, hero card. Uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, heroes. Well, it, amongst the 44 heroes, there's also going to be a bunch of uh, new heroes. So heroes that are not previously from Dota. Uh, we have an example here from the images that we have, which is Sola Khan. So Sola Khan is has eight attacks, six health. Um, has the item slots, which are unfulfilled, and also has a, a kind of passive ability here. Uh, we don't really know what Solar Khan's passive ability is, um, but we do kind of see uh, the passive abilities in some other cards, um, like this uh, Luna one here. Uh, Luna has a Lucent Beam, which reads, before the action phase, deal one piercing damage to a random enemy, random enemy and add a charge to each Eclipse card in your hand or deck. So it seems to synergize with the Eclipse spell, um, which is one that... Um, was that we saw in some of the other screenshots it was a card in the hand uh, and also kind of has some effect on the board so there's different kind of passives um, we will maybe get into some of the others uh, the other different mechanics a bit later but those are kind of the general breakdown of the different um, card types um, do you want to tell us a little bit more about what the the restrictions and how uh, how the actual like decks work uh, pandemonia all right, so much uh, much like Sia mentioned in Dota, there's five heroes in each team. So the limit is basically you're going to have five heroes in your deck. Uh, your deck is going to consist of a minimum of 40 cards. Uh, but it can, as far as I understand, there's no limit to how many cards you can have. Uh, three of a uh, There's three of a card in the deck. 
And the heroes themselves, as you can see, they have three different slots, a weapon, armor, and a bonus health buff. And the way that then the heroes tie in with the different cards is that there are colors. Mm -hmm. And these colors, if people have played Magic, you'll be very familiar You'll be very familiar with, uh, you know, the different colors. You have green, which is sort of your nature kind of uh, theme, which is buffs and uh, it buffs and creep. Uh, it's buffs and creep cards that focus on like utility and support, as well as like health regeneration. Your blue is your sort of your mage kind of classes, so focus on spells. So usually these will have weaker heroes, but really good spells. Then red, which is a little bit more, they have stronger heroes and weaker spells. So sort of your brutes, your, your tanky bruiser kind of characters. And then black is going to be, uh, the focus is sort of on the strong single target removal and displacement. So it's kind of your ninja, you know, damage and death kind of vibes. And the, the way this ties in with the heroes is that for you to be able to play a certain color card in a lane, you'll have to have a hero in that lane. There are going to be some exceptions. They did mention that obviously there's going to be some mechanics that allow you to play spells in different lanes based on abilities. But for the most part, to play a red spell in a certain lane, you're going to need a red hero there. Yeah. And so the colors restrictions you're going to you're allowed. I think you're going to be allowed two colors per de uh, deck. So obviously that's going to allow for obviously to try and you know try and get different synergies and things. Mm -hmm. uh, with regards to the limits. There's, the mana system works very much like most other card games where you're going to get one mana a turn. Uh, but unlike in many of these games, there's no restriction to how much mana you get in Artifact. So you will, you can have infinite uh, mana and there's also no hand size limit, which means that you're going to have a, you can have a massive hand and a massive, uh, uh, a massive deck, a massive, a massive amount of mana and a massive hand, which yeah. obviously is quite an interesting deviation. Yeah. And I mean, you talk about deck there, I believe it's going to be a 40 card minimum for deck size, but no maximum. So unlike you yeah. know, in Hearthstone where it's 30 cards, that's the min and the max, uh, we're actually going to have no maximum here, which is a lot more like uh, Magic, where there's a, a lower limit, but no upper limit. Yeah, and a lot of times this will end up, most like depending on how the game plays out, most of the times you end up wanting to stick to the minimum. Uh, in terms of statistically, you want to increase the statistics of drawing the cards, you know, your good cards and the cards that synergize well together. Yeah. But, you know, due to the drawn out nature of the game, you might end up actually having to put more cards into your deck in order to make sure you don't run out of resources. So it would be interesting to see. Yeah. Um, in terms of mana, it seems like each of the lanes also have their own mana. So, I mean, we can see in some of these images, you have like seven out of seven mana for this uh, lane. Uh, so it seems like the mana is independent of lanes, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it does. It does appear so, which for me, yeah. which makes for quite interesting sort of management of resources because uh, you, you meant all, you only have one hand of cards, and as I believe you draw two cards per turn, mm -hmm. and so it will be interesting the fact that you have to manage all those resources across the three lanes, each with their own amount of mana. So yeah. that I think that makes for a lot of very interesting decision making. And, yeah. I mean, that obviously is where a lot of the skill comes in, right? Yeah, and I mean, with these hero cards, there's some other mechanics as well that um, we've kind of rumored about. We don't necessarily know that much about some of them. Yeah, so some of the mechanics uh, that, you know, that we have seen, like, sort of in screenshots, we don't sure. Uh, there's Condemn, which, I mean, we can, from ju judging from the way, from what it means, we can only guess that it's some sort of removal mechanic uh exactly how it works we're not sure there's rapid deployment so the heroes each if a hero dies it it, it misses out a whole turn and then it respawns whereas if if a, if a apparently green heroes will have some of them will have rapid deployment which means when it dies it will be able to play the next turn mm. so akin to haste from magic or charge from hearthstone yeah it, then it there's spends a, less time on the sidelines yeah. yeah. I mean, it seems everything will attack the turn it's played in the sense that the, the auto attacking goes off, but uh, rapid yeah. deployment will allow it to get back into the battlefield if it dies. So it's like a, a, a shorter respawn timer if we had to compare it yeah. to how Dota works. Then one of the other mechanics mentioned is retaliate, which I can only guess if it, if it takes damage, it will deal some form of damage in return. And then there's taunt, which 
I mean, judging just from my little knowledge of Dota, as well as just the word taunt, it will force enemy minions to attack it in some form. Yeah. But like we say, the exact specifics and uh, rules of it, we know not These are all very speculative at this point in time, though. Yeah. And I mean, that's, you know, we talk about the mana, the uh, the colors and all that. That's not the, the kind of limit to the... Uh, the kind of resources that are going to be available to players. There's also going to be a, a gold system, which is a, also another thing that's yeah. kind of a, a, a throw or a crossover from Dota. Yeah, yeah. Let me t let me go through gold. So it's the other major resource that you have to manage in this game. So uh, it's earned by killing opponents. So I think this is why they've included uh, creep cards uh, in decks as well, because as in Dota, like your um, Killing heroes isn't your only way to get gold. It's mainly about killing other characters, smaller characters, and then slowly, uh, you know, accumulating gold and developing your heroes. So uh, after, so obviously the gameplay takes place over three boards, uh, and each player takes a turn on each of those boards. And then at the end, once you've gone through all three boards, then that's the end of a round. And as we understand it, um, after that. Um, round is completed then players will have the option of spending the gold that they've acquired during that round uh at the secret shop do you have that picture of it uh yeah I'll um bring it up in a second yeah yeah so we think that the players will be offered uh a selection from the secret shop so there is a list of uh the items that we know about already from the game uh some of the items do seem to be consistent with items that we've seen in dota with obviously different costs and different um attribute bonus, but at least having the names from uh, from Dota. And then quite a few of them, most of them actually, seem to be entirely new items. So here we can see Shield of Basilius, Traveler's Cloak, and Fountain Flask. So Traveler's Cloak is the only one that's like uh, anything like what you see in, in, in Dota. But um, in Dota, the cloak gives like magic resistance, right? Yeah, it gives magic resistance, but obviously there's no mechanic like that in this game. So it's just giving flat health. So obviously you can see uh, differences in prices. So um, Traveler's Cloak is close to uh, one of the cheapest items in the game, I think. Um, yeah, the most expensive item, the, the cheapest items are all three. And then the most expensive seem to be 25 uh, that we know of so far. So let me run, and none of the most expensive items are anything like we've seen in Dota so far. So there's one called Apotheosis Blade, which gives an equipped hero eight attack, four siege, and uh, equips, uh, I mean, condemns uh, units that are attacked by the hero that this is equipped to. Uh, then there's an item called Horn of Alpha, which is 25 gold, and it allows... It gives the equipped hero four health, and then it has an active ability to summon a Thunderhide pack, which I assume is a creep. Then the other two items that we don't know much about are Blade of Vigil and Ristool of, of Emblem, and their effects aren't completely known yet. So, so yeah, they look to be very powerful um, items that you can equip your hero with, mm -hmm. uh, and they're uh, unsimilar to... Some of them are, but most of them are not similar to current Dota items, and an important thing about uh, equipped items is that they stay equipped uh, whether or not your hero dies so uh, upon returning to lane uh, they'll the <laughs> uh, yeah <laughs> so i mean disaster it, it... yeah go on uh the hero will still have those items available to it yeah and it seems like the the items also have their kind of uh, slots right so we can see like traveler's yeah. cloak has the heart uh, um little icon which means it, it goes in that uh, health slot on the heroes like we saw on uh, luna or any of those um heroes we can see there's like a heart slot an armor slot and a weapon slot um and you know we can see in, in that image of the shop uh there's no weapon but there's uh, a shield um a health item and what seems like a, a single use kind of item um I, I so you, I assume those are, are different kind of items as well. The, the the fountain flask here, which fully heals a uh, unit, I think that reads. Yeah, uh, I would guess yeah. it would be an activatable ability. Yeah, so it because like some a... of the items do seem to have activatables just like in Dota, but uh, most of them seem to be passive. Yeah, 
Uh, the, the other mechanic that's missing is that in Dota, you buy smaller items and combine them into larger ones, yeah, with which I'm not sure is the case here. The, the only item that makes me think that is that Basilius Cloak, because obviously that's based off the smaller item Ring of Basilius, which is also present in this game. Uh, but it's unclear whether you would upgrade that item into the Basilius Cloak. Yeah, from what we can see, it doesn't seem like that will necessarily be uh, a mechanic from the start, at least. Um, so yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't know if you mentioned, but like it seems that the the it's kind of randomized as to what I items it offers you, uh, which is another reason maybe Absolutely. they didn't want to do that kind of recipe thing, uh, because you know you would be like unfortunate if you couldn't build the item you were trying to build towards because you didn't get offered it kind of thing. Um, so it seems like yeah. there'll be and a obviously you're introducing items, yeah. yeah you're introducing RNG and where it's also unclear whether or not it's uh, um because at the top of the secret shop here you can see item deck seven out of nine, so. Are are these item cards cards in your collection that you've bought, or is it part of the game that's accessible to all players? Yeah. You know, so are you making an item deck that's separate to your, you know, yeah. hero and minion deck? Yeah, that's interesting. interesting. Yeah, because obviously those are like you know kind of sometimes tech choices you can use to like augment your hero against or your one of your heroes against like an uh, an opponent's hero, right? Like in Dodo, we have items that uh, will increase your magic resistance. So if your uh, enemy lineup is full of very magic heavy um, heroes, then you would uh, buy a, a traveler's cloak in uh, Dodo at least. It would give you like magic resistance, right? So maybe that's kind of a way to. Um, it's almost akin to like a sideboard in a way, in that like it allows you to to augment your heroes in a way that yeah. can help them. But one that you access kind of... inside the game, which is yeah. interesting. Yeah, because uh, that's one of the interesting things is like how, how they balance that mechanic of like two decks versus each other, right? And if your opponent, like if you had to, if, if we looked at this from a Dota perspective, right? And you had to have five heroes that you chose beforehand like if, if we imagine dota drafts work like that it could be really lead to like really one-sided games because one team could just pick a draft that happens to be really good against the other you know like uh, an important part about competitive dota is at least that drafting stage um so it's going to be interesting to see you know how much of a weighting just which five heroes you put in your deck matters when you're coming up against other uh decks and other combinations of heroes um, and obviously that's also going to make it very interesting in terms of uh, archetypes uh if we look at you know compared to like traditional card games where you would have an archetype like in Hearthstone based on the, the class uh, or in Magic based on color combinations. Um, so this could lead to quite a wide variety of combinations with, you know, 44 heroes and um, only two colors per deck at least for now. Uh, okay, so there's a bunch of other um, information that we have that we can at least uh, mention and discuss. Uh, one of the big things that, that really um, jumped out to me was that they said they were going to be having a $1 million tournament. Um, they didn't really specify when, but uh, that was going to be the first tournament's going to be a $1 million tournament, which is obviously a bit of a throwback to TI1, right? Uh, when they also had like, a $1 million <laughs> tournament for Dota. So that kind of makes me think like, ooh, is Dota, is Artifact ever going to reach, you know, Dota levels of um, uh, prize pool? Because that would be massive. I mean, obviously, one of the big things with Artifact is it's going to be a single-player game, right? Or 1v1 game. So if you're winning a share of a million dollars, that's win more than winning it as a team. So if prize pools get anywhere near something like Dota, it could be very, very lucrative for the, the players. Uh, they also announced that with these tournaments, they're going to have like a, a compendium type of vibe where... Um, people will be able to contribute to the prize pool in some kind of way. And I mean, that's really what's driven the, the prize pool in Dota so big. So maybe that could work uh, for something like um, Artifact as well. Uh, does the idea of a million dollar tournaments uh, get you excited, Pandemonia? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, obviously when there's big money, it, it's the whole idea is to drive, you know, big, big, uh, big sponsors and big professional players. But obviously they're trying to sort of get kickstarted. And uh, I mean, you, you know, one will only see whether it drops from there on or if it increases, depending obviously on, you know, spectators, on sponsors, on the players, because yeah. it doesn't help, you, you know, the first tournament's all good and well, you have a million dollars, but if no one really cares about it or no one watches it, you know, the chances of that prize pool will just end up dropping and, yeah. you know, it's not, it won't be sustainable from a professional, you know, player's point of view. Yeah. And I mean, uh, do you think that this kind of... Uh system for prize pools will translate well to a card game having seen how well it's worked in in dota's here 
Look, I think the system did work in incredibly well uh, in Dota. I, I think partly because of how fun it was to watch and because of the benefits that the companion gave gave the players. Because in Dota, people don't people buy companions for themselves. Like the fact that they're increasing the price pool is nice, but that isn't necessarily what they're thinking about. They're thinking of the yeah. benefits that they're gonna get as a player buying the companion, which is typically like uh, Skin rares stuff. and stuff, stuff that you'd have yeah. to pay money for anyway. Yeah, and I mean, it's often more cost-effective to get those things through a compendium than otherwise. Yeah, all the different kind of skins that we see in Dota, and it, it does seem like skins are going to be a, a factor, possibly. You know, they've kind of hinted at that 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 that, that might be a, like alternate art, some community type stuff for um, artifacts, which could be quite interesting. Um, the one thing to note as well is that this isn't going to be a, a free-to-play game. Uh, unlike a lot of the it's card game competitors, uh, it is going to have an initial cost to buy, um, and um, we're not really sure what that initial cost is going to include, or from even well, we're not sure how much that initial cost is going to be. Uh, and after that, you'll be able to buy packs as well, and then you'll be able to um, kind of trade cards on the on the market. But we'll talk a little bit more about trading just now. But um, it's going to be pretty important for them what that initial cost. And then personally, I think one of the reasons they have that initial cost uh, is to get over the fact of, you know, like bots spamming. I mean, we've seen that in Dota where you get like games that are just full of bots that are spamming to play games to get items to sell them, right? It's a way of essentially just like making money. And obviously they want to avoid the, the market being flooded by, you know, bot accounts uh, in the same way that what they've done with CSGO as well is kept it to a minimal entry uh, cost, but some entry cost to prevent those kind of, you know, just like farming items on new accounts kind of thing. And especially if you get some kind of initial amount of card packs, it needs to be such that you can't just sell that initial amount off for more than you paid. Otherwise, if you could just do that to make money, which wouldn't really make yeah. any sense. Um, <laughs> It would just lead to a lot of dead accounts and, and that wouldn't really, especially if there's lots of bots playing, that wouldn't necessarily be a great experience for players. But um, I think it's probably less of a w bad experience than when it happens in Dota. Anyway, um, Definitely. so uh, what are your guys' overall thoughts about the, the mechanics then? You know, we've discussed a lot of these mechanics. Any notes you want to make about anything from heroes to the board system? Uh, any just overall thoughts about the, the kind of mechanics that we've we already mentioned? So for me, the, the game, as much as it really looks fascinating and quite complex, for me, the main concern of the mechanics is how long a game's going to take. Uh, in terms of, you know, with Hearthstone and a lot of other card games, they've kind of angled for faster, you know, like sort of quick games that you can kind of use as fillers, whether you're on the bus going to work or, you know, when you have a quick 10, 15 minutes to kill, or even waiting it for a Dota game or another game. Whereas just judging, like just sort of the, from the little information we have with the three lanes, you know, the 40 health, the 80 health from the Ancients, it looks like one of these, one game of Artifact is easily going to last 45 minutes to an hour. And for me, I'm just concerned as to what that means, A, for like a mobile, and also for, a, you know, for a casual perspective. Because, you know, a lot of people like the games like Hearthstone because, mm -hmm. oh, I can just play one quick game of five to ten minutes. Whereas, you know, a game like Dota or CSGO, if you decide you want to play a competitive game, you, you know that you invest in the next, you know, hour, two hours into playing that game. You know, you've, you've dedicated that time. So that's sort of the interesting concern I have. Yeah, I think uh, it is definitely a, a point worth mentioning. I, I'm not sure that the games will necessarily be 45 minutes. I think that's probably a little bit much, um, but it is very difficult to tell. I mean, you kind of have to look at the scale of uh, the health of a tower versus the attack of minions. And I mean, if we look at like a buffed up axe that we saw earlier with 15 attack, that can take down a tower very quickly if not dealt with. So it's going to be very interesting to see what the, the different archetypes are and then the average kind of game length there. Uh, the other factor to do with uh, this length of game thing is uh, the thing about CSGO and Dota is that they're team games and a lot of the part that makes games take so long is the fact that if you quit, you're ruining the game for your teammates. But this is a single player game. Mm -hmm. So if you concede, it's it's only affecting yourself. Um, yep. So I think that will maybe make people be more willing to play even if they aren't sure they have you know that full hour to spend. Yeah, that's a good point. 
you know, yeah, as you're saying, it's only uh, punishing yourself if you if you quit early. Uh, before and the game play. won't have to punish people for leaving, you know, yeah. if they need to. Like in Dota and Counter-Strike, they do have to. Yeah. Um, okay, so I, what about heroes? Um, do, do you like this mechanic overall, Pandemonia, Seer? Any, any thoughts on, like, you know, do you think heroes are going to be the core defining factor? Or do you think spells? Like, I mean, we see I think a lot of spells be. are, like, uh, seem to be hero um, spells that we see in games. So, like, especially, like, ultimates like Eclipse. Uh, you know, in the Luna card, the passive mentioned Eclipse. So, it seems like there's going to be synergy between the heroes and the spells. Other than the fact that, obviously, you have to have heroes of that uh, color in order to have those spells and play them in, in any given lane. So, I mean... Yeah, you know the the hero mechanic. Are you do you like this as a card game mechanic in general, Panamonia? It'll be a bit. I don't know. I'm a, I'm cautiously optimistic because the problem with these sort of games is quite easy. Is that the hero can become a, a bit sort of the overshadowing element of the game. Mm -hmm. So obviously, you know, from Dota, the hero is obviously meant to be sort of the main sort of we should have called the antagonist of the whole game. And, you know, it looks, already from what we know, it does look like the heroes are going to sort of be the leading, the defining part of the game. I mean, the colors determine what cards your deck can play. You know, its effect will probably determine how you build your deck. But the sort of the worry is that, you know, it might become a bit too sort of RPG-like in the fact that, you know, the game will be decided by, you know, who's got the bigger hero with the better weapons and the equipment rather than the strategy and you know, the use of the spells, the creeps, and the other smaller things, you know. Mm -hmm. So it'll be interesting to see how they balance that, if yeah. they do, or if they do want the focus to be on, you know, heroes dominating lanes, right? Yeah, and I mean, uh, as well as when it comes to, like, heroes and rarity and, you know, how you, how easy it is to access the heroes, um, that's going to be interesting to see because you don't want, like, let's say, you know, my favorite hero from playing Dota is Luna, but now I can't get the Luna card like oh I've, it's really expensive it's op or like maybe it's just super underpowered i think those kind of things are, are going to be interesting uh and sia for you do you like the the hero yeah. kind of mechanic with the hero mechanic my thoughts on it are so so you get three heroes if, on your side deployed at the beginning of the game but then my concern is with a card game you always have draw rng so what if your remaining heroes are sitting at the bottom of your deck and they are, you know, they're the linchpins to your strategy? Mm. I guess it's a problem with any with any card game, but I think specifically with this sort of mechanic where you're putting so much weight on uh, certain cards, like draw, drawing them early could be a, a major factor. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I think um, that is definitely going to be an issue when it comes to the heroes being in your deck and... Like maybe there'll be some effects to kind of uh, tutor out heroes, uh, maybe, but um, difficult to say at this point. Okay, so um, if there was one big thing that you could have that uh, would come with the launch of the game, uh, what would it be? Uh, let's start with uh, Panamonia. So for me, I mean, the fact that I started playing Magic, and it is called Magic, is a trading card game. For me, the, main, the big thing really about it uh, is trading. You know, the ability to, you know, trade with other players, to buy and sell cards. And I think, mm -hmm. uh, just as a note, I think they have mentioned that they will be doing this. But for me, it, it adds an extra dynamic to the game because, like, like you know, the cards end up having a value outside of the game, which means that, like, if you are quite smart at terms of following the trends, much like following stock markets, you, you know, you can actually create and get cards and create a collection from, a lot less money than let's say it's worth just mm. by you know predicting that a card's going to be worth a lot more or a lot less before a tournament and let's say a pro does well with that card you know the, your, the value goes up and you can sell those cards yeah so for, it adds like an interesting extra i don't know almost you can call it a mini game as such yeah. uh, but i mean this money game involves real money <laughs> and you can use it to make money or you or can use it to obviously build your collection and get cards or at least steam money <laughs> yeah, steam money, uh, which I mean is still. Translate. Yeah, that's it can be translated to real money, uh, through yeah. some slight back alleys. Uh, but yeah, I mean the trading <laughs> perspective is definitely going to be interesting. Uh, with uh, all the card games we've seen, you know the the CCGs, pretty much everything except maybe Magic: The Gathering Online. Uh, there hasn't really yeah. been much of a trading mechanic. Um, 
And that's been something that's been missing for a lot of fans of uh, paper card games. You know, the big thing that digital card games have over them is just the um, the convenience issue and or the convenience factor. Sorry. Uh, so if you can convince the, the the physical TCG players so that they can get involved because they have this collection that, as you mentioned, they can you know make money trading. They can sell their collection when they're done with playing the game. And I think that's an important factor. Like something we hear a lot. Um, I imagine you hear this as well when talking to, let's say, Magic players about Hearthstone is that they, they don't like that they're going to collect all these cards, but then they're not going to be able to sell them. There's no resale value. Uh, but that's definitely not going to be an issue for... Um, um, artifacts. The resale value might change, but that's kind of the same with magic. I mean, when a card rotates yeah. out of standard, generally its cost goes down unless it's powerful and modern or other formats. And uh, and they have mentioned that they will have rotating formats. Just another little uh, tidbit that we can fill in there. Um, but for Sia, uh, do do you want to say anything about the trading before you can mention? Your uh, no, um, I think you guys know much more about it than I do. Um, I do want to comment on what I hope for the game, though, and yeah. I think what I what I want to see from it is to not because we all know what valve is doing here they're trying to cash in on the pie that that blizzard has with hearthstone and and i don't want this game to just be you know valve's version of hearthstone i want it to have its own feeling uh because you know i love dota as a game so i want this game to have that that essence behind what makes Dota Dota. And I think a lot of these mechanics that they're introducing and the complexity that they're putting in the game will make it uh, feel that way. But it's, it, you know, that's something that will be a non-negotiable for me. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I am concerned about for this game is, um, is, is the balance. And particularly with regards to snowballing, I, w I've been watching Dota throughout its, you know, a large part of its development and its growth into the game that it currently is. And one of the big issues that it's had to deal with, and Hotstone too, I think, is uh, the fact that a player who gets an advantage will keep it and will, you know, dominate the game from, from that point. So I think they have to, and especially with the way they're structuring this uh, style of play, I think they have to be very careful of that becoming a, a major driving force behind the meta of this game. So I think they have to think very carefully about how they're going to implement comeback mechanics and how they're going to make uh, other strategies other than aggro viable in this sort of game. Yeah, the kind of more reactive strategies where you're you know, responding even though you're like uh, behind. Because, I mean, as you mentioned, you, know, you can easily snowball a lane. You can like um, all-in push a lane essentially as well. Uh, that's going to be the kind of you know strategies we're going to see with the, the two different win conditions we spoke about earlier, mm. uh, and obviously and the especially other, with gold. The other is gold. Yeah, yeah. Gold, gold is the big one, right? That's one of the big factors. Because gold, you can only in, get it. Dota. Yeah, you only get gold when you're killing things when you're ahead. So for a player behind to get gold is much more difficult, and it looks like the items are extremely powerful. Mm. Yeah, that's a very good uh, point there. I mean, uh, Panamonia, do you see any like? Uh, do you, anything you want to add to that that issue of uh, keeping the Dota feeling and, and keeping that kind of balance? Yeah, I mean, for me, so I don't know much about Dota. I've barely played, I think, an hour of it because a friend forced me to. But in terms of the balance aspect, I mean, that's, that's a very good point is, you know, you want there to be a, a fine balance between being able to, like, let's say, push ground at advantage and snowball and also be able to still come back. So, you know, like you say, it'll be interesting to see how they manage the gold because from what it looks like if you just start let's say if you push aggressive early you're going to have a lot more gold than your opponent mm. which results in you have been able to buy better items which might just make you know the whole game sort of unwinnable because there's so it will be interesting to see different games have different sort of ways that they try to address and to you know different comeback mechanics yeah. so it'll be interesting to see you know maybe there are cards that reward you because i mean uh, we haven't seen this, but you know there might be cards that say if you have more than ten, if if you're, you know, if you have a lot less gold than your opponent, maybe it does a special ability, or maybe you know there's some way of catching up. But yeah. I mean, we'll have to see that with that. Yeah, I mean that could definitely be the case. I think the other important thing is to note is you can kind of dictate your opponent's economy to a certain extent because you have to play the cards for them to kill. Uh, in order to yep. gain the gold. So if you're playing very conservative, you can hold 
back and then the resource that you're relying on is your tower health you're kind of tanking damage on your tower if you're not putting cards yeah. on the board so i think that's definitely going to lead to uh, ways of playing where you do take a bit of tower damage it'll be interesting to see if there's ways to heal your tower in any kind of way um or any, any kind of mechanics that involve you interacting with your own tower like to buff it heal it anything like that um so i think it, it, that's definitely going to be uh, an interesting point uh, and I, it, it's going to be important that they do have lots of different archetypes, right? Because what we've learned about card games um, and interacting with card game communities is people like to have different ways of playing the game. And I think that's a very important thing that they, they do need to consider uh, and a very good point yeah. there. Um, so for me, the big thing that I'm worried about uh, as a caster and having seen some other card games and how they've not necessarily lived up to the hype, uh, the big thing that I'm worried about for Valve, especially with this million dollar tournament, uh, is the spectator experience. Now, we've talked about how the game seems to be a little bit uh, complicated. You know, it has it has a lot of depth to it. Uh, but the question is, can it be an enjoyable experience for people to watch? First of all, from a tournament perspective, is this going to be something that's going to hold, you know, 10, 20,000 viewers? Um, is it going to be fast paced enough, action packed enough? Um, to actually deliver an entertaining experience. And then there's also the, the streamer experience, uh, streamer kind of perspective for me as well. Uh, as somebody that streams Hearthstone, uh, it's, it's very nice because you can interact with your chats and stuff like that. Um, now is that, you know, is, um, and Hearthstone's easy enough to follow along even if you don't necessarily know that much about the game. And is that gonna be true with Artifact as well? Is it gonna be a decent thing to, to spectate? And I mean, uh, Ultimately, like those are the the two big factors that um, interest me uh, is actually the the spectator perspective of the game. I, I think that's going to be a very important thing for them to um, ensure. I mean, w what would make a an entertaining um, spectacle for you as somebody that maybe necessarily doesn't watch a lot of Hearthstone but's watched a lot of Dota's? Yeah. I think. I think it as a spectator sport, it should have the same appeal as Dota. You know, seeing. <laughs> but in Dota, seeing big like... plays, seeing good strategy, seeing good combinations, um, and seeing it all cul culminate, you know, into a victory at the end. Even though, because Dota is fun to watch, yeah. uh, even though it takes an hour, but it, it <laughs> as you say, it does have to be ac action packed. Yeah, I mean, Dota, you get the the obviously there's the mechanical. Um you know reflex elements oh he pulled off a clutch alt a clutch stun those kind of things but that's obviously not necessarily going to be a thing in a turn-based game in general um so you know implementing that kind of side of things from a spectator perspective yeah. might not but be i think it has to be a, a strategy thing because half the appeal of watching the best teams in the world play dota is seeing how they use uh hero combinations and strategy combinations to um you know outwit basically yeah. So the, the hero and the combinations and the strategy needs to be in-depth enough that you can really see an, a, one player um, outskilling or outwitting another player, but also um, easy enough for people to understand. Because that's one of the biggest problems. Uh, I mean, you and I have done this set with friends of ours and watched Dota, and they might not know a lot about Dota. And you basically spend a lot of the time explaining the heroes and their abilities and stuff. Uh, and then they don't necessarily have as much time to appreciate that strategy. So I think that's going to be a very interesting perspective. And that's going to be a, the challenge for you know casters working in um, artifacts is to com combine those two things to make it easier to understand and to kind of present what the strategy and the intricacies of that strategy are. Yeah, good like, point. Coming from a Hearthstone perspective, like watching and casting Hearthstone, I think that's you, you know you kind of nailed it on the head there. A lot of this is going to be at the end of the day, it's going to be on the honest of the the casters and the presenters, hmm. because in in Dota, you know, you have a lot more action, a lot more uh, sort of you can see what's happening, whereas sometimes. You know, in card games, uh, I mean, like, take Hearthstone, for example, it's not actually always obvious what the player is thinking about or planning, you yeah. know. And, you, I mean, sometimes the classes even actually might miss completely when that plan ends up culminating in victory, you know, because you're obviously not in the mind of the person. And because it's turn-based, you don't have these sort of action-packed sequences where you can work out, oh, wow, well, okay, he pulled this move to do this, and, oh, there's a team kill. Or, oh, you know, they separate, yeah. they isolated the guy. Or, you know, whatever. So it's going to be very interesting. The car, It's going to be a lot of the casters to try and make it sort of in-depth enough to cover the important aspects, but still easy enough to appeal to, you know, players. Like, I still, I mean, I know the basics of Dota and, and let's say CSGO, but I struggle to watch them because, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm not on a high enough competitive level to know you know, I mean, I watch some of the like top CS:GO tournaments, and 
you know, when they, they throw around the different tactics and they throw around the different locations. And because I don't know enough of the game, I get lost into what's happening besides, yeah. oh, they won a round. You know, yeah. And that's obviously the, the fine balance you've got to strike, I think. Yeah, those kind of games really have that combination of like the hype moments, the black holes, uh, all those kind of moments <laughs> we see in, in Dota, um, or the Liquid are doing it, those kind of things, you know, the storylines and the, the, the real, like the hype screamy moments, um, the million dollar dream coils, all that kind of stuff uh, combined with the, the, the strategy. And it definitely presents the ability to watch it on two levels, either just watching it for the hype or watching it really in depth for the strategy. So I think that's a really good point. You know, we, we could want to see what we want to see is a game where you can watch it on both those levels. And I think yeah. the biggest part is going to be addressing that, uh, making it exciting to watch because uh, for like the newer players, right? Because that's what the majority of your audience is not necessarily always going to be people that play the game, uh, you know, at an in-depth level. So, I mean, we see that in Hearthstone and, 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 and other card games. So I think that's going to be a v very important um, aspect for them to address. And uh, I, you know, Valve have a pretty good track record of uh with their esports type games uh bar maybe tf2 and uh how they kind of let that <laughs> one fail but let's not get into that one um <laughs> so what we do know is the game is originally going to be released in 2018 just for desktop and then in 2019 they intend to go mobile with the game uh for the um uh for the tablets at first so ipads and android tablets uh, and we're not sure then if, when it'll be maybe released on phones. Um, so, you know, I mean, Panamonio, you already kind of addressed the, the possible issues that they might have with um, mobile. Uh, any other thoughts you guys want to add on to the, the mobile topic? For me, I'm sort of also a bit worried about the fact that, you know, it seems like there's a lot of information on the screens. I mean, and we, I mean, we just saw, you know, yeah. how they're going to try and fit all that information and the, the fact that there's three boards into, you know, a, a, I mean, a tablet screen is going to be difficult, but if they ever want to take it to a cell phone or a mobile, you know, how difficult it's going to be. I mean, Hearthstone, you know, again, like Hearthstone struggles. Yeah. And I mean, they've said that there's, you know, there's no mana limit, there's no creep limit. So how, yeah. or, I mean, this, this is either going to be a very cluttered interface or there's going to be a lot of swapping on your phone to try and play this game, you know, properly, right? Yeah. And um, I mean, the one thing around that is it, uh, the Hearthstone developers have often uh, cited it as a, um, a limitation when it comes to developing features for all the clients, you know, like deck slots, for instance. Uh, one of the issues was around uh, mobile or adding new modes. One of the issues is around, you know, mobile and how you fit the, the items on the screen real estate. And so um, that's definitely going to be a, an issue for um the artifact dev team and it's interesting that they're kind of going to that second and first focusing on the game personally i really like that because for me i'm mostly going to play this on um, desktop you know i have a tablet as well so i can play it on tablets and it's great that i can have a mobile way to play the game that is kind of important to me with card games these days um but i wouldn't be too upset to see it take a while to come out on phone if, if they can make sure that the core game players you know lives up to all that we're we've kind of mentioned that we're hoping for for the game um, so we kind of mentioned the, the non-free-to-play aspect. Uh, one of the other aspects is that, you know, with the buying of packs, uh, they did kind of mention that uh, it might involve some kind of draft or sealed format, something interesting like that. Um, one of the people that is involved with this game is um, Richard Garfield, uh, the creator of Magic the Gathering. He's been involved uh, heavily with the game since the beginning, so uh, that gets uh, Magic the Gathering fans like myself and Pandemonia pretty hyped. Uh, and you know, <laughs> we we know that there's some player, some people with a very good um, brain when it comes to developing these kind of card games involved, and that that's definitely a positive aspect. Um, so you know, we, that's kind of why we might see some of the influences from Magic as well. Um, it's not that they're copying Magic; they literally have the designer of, you know, the the original creator of Magic involved, and so some of those ideas are going to be similar. You know, the colors, the drafting is one of the biggest things that. Um, Magic still has for me that other card games don't. Uh, and then when yep. it comes to, uh, we also the rotating formats. That's another thing that Magic has been doing for a very long time that they've also kind of mentioned. Uh, and then when it comes to the game at the moment, it's in a closed beta currently. No real news on when it will be going to maybe an open beta and a release and what the story is going to be like for that. Um, 
we don't really have any information on the release date. Personally, I speculate that it's going to have something to do with um, the international this year. International. Yeah, I, I think they will maybe have a show match and maybe launch it soon after the international. Maybe um, closed beta for... I've seen on Reddit some speculation that there'd be uh, some beta keys for maybe people that buy compendiums for Dota uh, for the international. Uh, they that could would be definitely awesome. do something like that. Um, the only reason I don't like that one so much is those are Dota fans, not card gaming people necessarily. But I would buy a compendium. But just you'll to get hear about it. Yeah, it's just a yeah, hundred so. bucks. Yeah. Anyway. Um. So I mean, I definitely have think they're going to use. Have they ever had that? Use... Where... No. I'd have, they, have they ever had like a paid open beta? No. They've had pre-order where you've been able to pre-order games before with other games. Not not Valve games now. Um, I, Valve. I don't. Valve have not done a lot of cross-game. Um, kind of. Um, promotion either like that you know this is kind of the first game that actually has any reason for cross game promotion you know all of the other games are completely separate universes nowhere near really related uh, so this is i think the first time they'll really be doing any kind of cross game promotion if they did that as well uh, but i definitely think an announcement at uh, ti or release uh, even just if it's a release date announcement at ti or release soon after ti with maybe a show match could be uh, reasonable as this was announced last year at the international so it kind of makes sense uh, in terms of the time frame me personally i'd like it as early as possible uh, so i can get my hands on it but i also kind of trust valve when it comes to you know making a a good finished product um they and, take their time yeah that. yeah so uh, it was a big surprise that they even just said 2018 last year right we had to have known that the game was pretty far in development for them to even say that because uh valve giving release dates is not uh Something they're very well known for, let's say. Where's my Half-Life 3, dude? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and another thing they've mentioned is that they also want to have tournaments for all levels. So this is kind of facilitating, I imagine, the kind of Friday Night Magic um, and the different, you know, like Commander and all these other kind of more casual formats we see in Magic. Uh, and that seems to be something that the, the developers are uh, interested in, in focusing and I mean, I think that's going to be a very important thing to keep the more casual audience also engaged with um, the competitive spectating uh, side. I mean, Panamonia, you, we've kind of seen a lot in, in Hearthstone how people like to be involved in these kind of uh, different tournaments, right? Not just the strictly just the competitive ones, whether it be fireside gatherings or, you know, some of the tournaments that like uh, you've been involved in hosting at the Nexus where they're kind of um, different formats, you know, uh, like the restricted kind of formats on how you're allowed to build your deck etc those kind of things yeah you know it's, it's trying to get more casual you know and a lot of some of it you know some of the tournaments is obviously aiming to be entry into competitive scene where some of the other events are more about community building mm. and about networking and just socializing and meeting like-minded players you know so that's like the i mean and it looks like that's kind of the angle that they're going to be striving to to try and build because that's how you grow a community right it's about getting new players into it it's about Building, uh, building a friendly helping community and you know like that's you know that's obviously what they're trying to do with hearthstone yeah. and i can imagine that's probably what they'll be trying to do with artifact as well yeah and they're definitely gonna have to have some kind of mobile platform to make it uh, really uh useful in terms of community because you can't exactly be shipping your pc around those days are yeah. kind of gone um so <laughs> even, even laptops like we we you kind of do for hearthstone i mean at a competitive level it's perfectly fine that you would need to play yeah. a desktop but I mean, we see a lot of people at firesides and those kind of events that will be playing on their mobile. So, um, yeah, so we'll tablets a good start, uh, and yeah, uh, you know, phones later than that is going to be interesting. Uh, anything else you guys want to add uh, before we kind of close off this episode? I mean, we've covered most of the news. Uh, we'll have links in the in the description on YouTube. Uh, this is going to be obviously the very first kind of pre-episode for Artificers. Um, we're going to be doing uh, episodes as soon as we really get any kind of concrete information. There's not, we're not doing like a, you know, a weekly podcast this time because we might not have news every week. Um, so we're just going to be bringing you guys uh, updates whenever we get information. Uh, and then we'll start with, you know, uh, we're calling this, you know, hype episode, pre-episode one, because it's, uh, it's kind of, um, we will start numbering them once Artifact actually releases. That's when we'll start with actual episode yeah. one. So any other, um, uh, input you guys want to have before we close off this episode i'm just looking quite forward to it it sounds like it's, it might be a good change of pace from a lot of the other card games so i'm quite ex excited to see what it brings and i'm looking forward to you know when they release more beta keys so that you know the rest of us can get a hold of it <laughs> yeah 
I'm also seriously looking forward to it. I think the way it's angling itself in the card game space is exactly where it needs to be for, you know, what I want it to be. Yeah. So, yeah, full of hype, I suppose is the word, but also cautious. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, thanks everyone for, um, for uh, watching. And uh, hopefully everyone else is just as excited about Artifact as uh, we are. And hopefully we'll get some more information soon and we'll bring another episode to you soon. So uh, make sure you follow on um, uh, Twitter, I mean on Twitch. Uh, you can also find us on Twitter if you want to find out more information. I'm sure we'll be tweeting about it as well. Uh, you can find Seer uh, at Seer Dota. Uh, you can find Panamonia at Panamonia ZA. That's with a three and a zero in his name. Uh, and you can find me at div underscore gaming. And then you can also subscribe on YouTube, which is where the podcast is going to be going up. Uh, and also please give us any feedback in the comments section. Maybe share any information we missed so that other viewers can um, keep up to date. And we'll make sure to cover any other new information on the next episode. So, yeah, thanks a lot, everyone. Um, and from us, cheerio. Cheers.